Hello everyone, let's get this started. My name is Katie and today I'll be your host for your buying a home in The Hague. Uh, can I just have a quick feedback? Can you all see me and hear me very clearly? Just to make sure you can pop your questions and uh, your answers in the chat. I have a yes, thank you very, very much. If uh, at some point you can't hear or see anything, please just let us know and we'll fix that immediately. So, Let's get started. Uh, again, my name is Katie. I am an expat buying manager in um, Expat Housing Network. Oh. I am originally Cypriot, uh, half Cypriot, half British. I was born and raised in Cyprus, but I do have to say that uh, Rotterdam has been my home away from home for quite a while now. Um, and just for your information, I work mostly on the Rotterdam and the Hague regions. Uh, with me today, we, I, we have my colleague uh, Rick. He'll be in chat support. Uh, he had some technical difficulties, so he'll be joining in a bit uh, and start answering your questions. Um, if we leave any questions unanswered, that's because uh, we um, intend answering those at the end. So let's get started. Greatness is achieved in the agency of others. What do we mean by that? Uh, of course, you will have your uh, for, uh, person of contact when you come with us to buy a property. However, it's important for you to know that it's the whole team that's working on your file. So you actually have a lot of pairs uh, of eyes on um, your situation uh, and a lot, a lot of input in, in that way. We just wanna make sure that we are we are helping you in the most uh, effective way as possible. So a little bit more about EHN. We are not traditional real estate agents. What do we mean by that? Uh, we are not focused on the higher price. We're only focused on customer satisfaction and making the process as smooth and easy for you as possible. So um, yeah, that's what we care about, your satisfaction and not the higher price. Uh, we help with buying and renting at the moment. Uh, we charge a fixed fee, which is really nice. You don't have to worry about um, the extra uh, commission rate that you need to pay at the end. Uh, so no commission for us, just a fixed fee. Don't expect any surprises in the prices. Um, and of course, we know what it's like to settle in a new country. 95% of our uh, company um, is uh, made from experts. So we definitely know how it feels and we can empathize with your needs. Uh, what is our added value? Uh, selling agents do take our offers more seriously. That's because they know we've done our due diligence. They know that we've checked our clients and they know that uh, our clients are ready to move forward with buying a house and their financing is sorted out. So there's a little bit uh, more trust in there. Uh, we can sometimes book viewings when it's no longer possible because of a busy period. This is not a guarantee but we do have access to uh, uh, our network and a lot of days they do arrange special agent days for us to attend with our clients. Uh, we support by reviewing Dutch legal documents and property documents. Uh, that's very important, especially when you don't speak the language. So we got you covered there. Um, and of course we help you define the market value through market data. That's the most important thing. Um, I, we will talk a little bit more about the asking prices and everything on Funda later on. Uh, but yeah, the most important thing is to know how to justify the numbers. Uh, we will definitely inform you about rules within the neighborhood or the city you are uh, and regulations that might apply uh, to your property. Uh, and of course, we make sure that you don't make the same mistakes as we did. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? Of course, we had a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'm going to share with you some market information that will be um, uh, useful for your search um, and maybe answer some of your questions already. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit more about market drivers. So what, um, um, what are the regulations or or uh, um, uh, news that affect the market. We're gonna talk a little bit more about savings, how much you should have before um, starting your buying process. Uh, and of course, a little bit more about uh, how to win uh, in the market. And of course, mention the tem timeline step-by-step step so you, you uh, know a little bit more to expect when uh, you get an offer accepted. 
So uh, enough about uh, what we're gonna do today. Before we move forward, uh, I would just like to know uh, where in the process are you? Uh, just to know uh, a little bit more how we can support you. I'm just gonna um, uh, open a poll here. Um, let me just text. There we go. So where in the process are you? Would love to hear more about your situation, maybe. Um, there's a lot we can share about the stage that you are and we can support you. If you can see the poll on your screen, I'm getting some answers. I see a lot of people are researching. So it's a good starting point that you're here. Um, I see a lot of people are also viewing. Did you chat with an agent? Oh my God, we have a lot of no's there. <laughs> so I'm happy you're here guys. And did you chat with the mortgage broker? We have yes and no's mixed answers. Great, I'll just give a few seconds for everyone to reply. I see there's more answers coming in and that's it. Great, so um, Please, uh, I see that a lot of you are in the orientation uh, uh, stage as well. So uh, please just take the time to pop any questions you have in the Q&A. Uh, and at the end of this webinar, we're gonna go through your questions um, and answer them if they haven't been already answered. Great. To move forward, uh, some numbers in the Netherlands. This has been the development of the selling price since 2005 in the whole country up to 2021. Last year, we closed with uh, 438,000 in the existing build and um, uh, in the new builds, we closed with 466,000 as an average selling price. A little bit more about the Hague, a little bit more specific. I'm gonna dive in these numbers a little bit and explain a little bit more about them. Uh, of course, we have uh, quarter four data from last year uh, since quarter one is not finished yet. So houses sold, uh, you see that this is a minus of 80% from last year and then a 10% from last quarter. Please do keep in mind that it is the natural time of the year for things to start slowing down. It's the end of the year. There's a lot of holidays involved. There's a lot of people traveling, going home, visiting family. So it is natural for uh, the pace to drop a little bit um, uh, at the end of the year. Uh, houses for sale. Uh, you see, again, this was a minus 32% from last year uh, and a small, small increase from last quarter. The average selling price, however, kept going 452 uh, to close the quarter with that was a 20% increase from last year, plus a 3% increase from uh, last quarter. Um, and then of course the average price per square meter followed with 18% um, above from last year, 2% uh, from last quarter. And the sales time has been um, uh, decreased uh, almost 11% from last year and has been increased 8.7 uh, from last quarter. So uh, things can be done uh, quite fast, that's uh, there for sure. Great, so market drivers, what can affect the market? Uh, of course, we have the fiscal benefits. One of them could be the tax ex exemption. Uh, at the moment, there's a tax exemption going on. Um, the normal tax rate you would pay for residential mortgage, residential property would be at 2%. If you are younger than 35, never bought a home in the Netherlands before, um, and buy something that has a value from 400 and below, then you are exempt from the 2%, you pay 0% tax. So uh, that's a very nice discount. If you uh, are eligible for it, I would uh, recommend that you grab it before it's too late. Um, we still have an interest rebate going on. Uh, what that means is that your interest rate on your mortgage is tax deductible, which is very, very nice. Um, there, at the moment, there are no capital gains on the profit that you make on your property when you sell it. So um, uh, that's a, definitely a good way to store some value and um, uh, gain on it uh, without being taxed for a few years. Um, and at the moment, there's also a tax-free parent donation going on up to 100K uh, when you uh, gift money to your child to buy a home. However, they mentioned that this uh, might be ending soon. It's not very clear when, uh, but uh, maybe next year or at the end of the year, we'll see this uh, no longer being uh, possible. 
Uh, of course, we still have low interest rates. Interest rates at the moment could be between 1.5 and 2. Um, so yeah, grab the opportunity. It's been the lowest for quite a while. Uh, of course, at the moment, uh, I guess a lot of you are renting at the moment, so you do know how the renting market is. It is pretty aggressive. It is pretty expensive. And to be honest, most of the times, uh, it would be that if you buy a house, you would pay less uh, on a monthly basis for your mortgage than what you're already paying now. And of course, if you have a house, you also uh, build equity on that. So uh, that's something definitely to consider. Um, lack of supply, that's the biggest all-time problems in the Netherlands. Uh, there's around 300,000 uh, uh, housing shortage. Uh, the government has planned on building 100,000 uh, uh, new projects every year, but um, yeah, and that's a big lack of supply. People are in need of homes, there's a higher demand than supply, so that is a natural um, a price driver. Uh, some news that have affected the market, of course, um, more specific to, to Den Haag, there's um, a self-occupancy obligation. Uh, this is not effective yet, um, and we, we don't have uh, any recent updates. They need to um, uh, uh, make some announce, announcements after February. But they have recommended that as uh, from March 1st, the properties uh, that have a was value up to 355 uh, will, uh, will include a permanent self-occupancy clause. There are some uh, um, situations that this won't apply. For example, if you rent to immediate family uh, and also housing corporations are uh, exempt from this. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, you won't be able to rent your property. And the reason that is happening is to remove the private investor or, or generally investors from the lower range properties. So there is a little bit uh, less competition with just an average buyer. Um, yeah, it would be nice not to be faced with uh, someone who has uh, a lot of cash uh, versus a family who is just trying to buy a home. So automatically investors are barred from that price range. Uh, there's less competition for the average buyers. Do keep in mind the competition will be there, uh, but at least you won't compete in with the bigger sharks, let's say. Uh, and this is a regulation that 60% of the municipalities uh, in the Netherlands already have. Um, it does differ from city to city, uh, but in Den Haag, this is what applies. Uh, another uh, um, update that has, has affected the market is, of course, the national mortgage guarantee from 325 to uh, in 2021. It has been moved to 355 in 2022. Uh, of course, the, uh, this amount is uh, linked with the average house uh, um, selling uh, price. So it means that the higher the average prices go, the higher the, the mortgage guarantee will be. Um, and this took effect since um, the first day of this year. Uh, a little bit more about the interest rates. Uh, they are projected to rise slightly in 2022. However, that is not predicted to stay in the long term. Uh, and they do think that uh, the, the, houses will, the house prices will continue rising. Um, uh, but uh, of course, in a slower rate than uh, it has been rising in 2021. Uh, generally, low interest rates uh, and inflation could also be temporary. So let's talk a little bit more about savings. For this one, uh, I would ask that you put your questions in the chat. And I'm just wondering if you have any idea or have any opinion about how much you would need in savings before you start. If you want to mention also for what you will need it, uh, then we can also uh, talk a little bit more about that. So let me see some questions coming in. This is a chat, not a poll. So you can uh, give your answers in the chat. I see now 10% of your home value at least. Okay, okay. Anyone else want to dare and answer the question? How many savings do you think you, can, you should have before you start? 20% I see, I've heard around 17K for a 400 deal with an extra bit. Okay, 25%, okay. Uh, is this down payment or finance requirement? No, it's not a down payment um, or has anything to do with the 10% of the mortgage. 
30% depends on the market value. Yeah, I see some good uh, thinking over there, depending on the mortgage you get. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, guys, for your answers. Uh, I'm just moving forward to a cost table, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Do keep in mind that now I am only talking about the, the savings that you will need to cover the cost of the buying process. Uh, if you're eligible to pay a transfer tax, then expect to pay around five to 6% of the purchase price of your home. Of course, in higher ranges, uh, on, uh, on a higher range that also changes, uh, the tax is bigger as well there. Um, and then if you're not, uh, if you're eligible not to pay the tax, then that means that your costs are around two to 3%. So, uh, this is, uh, of course, the transfer tax. We just talked about it. From the notary, what do you expect if you're going from uh, with a mortgage? Of course, you will need a mortgage deed that could cost uh, anything from 600 to 1,100. It could be a little bit more also. Um, of course, if you are buying a, a property with all cash, then a mortgage deed is not needed. Uh, however, uh, most likely it would be that you need a mortgage uh, and it would be also a good time to borrow the money since it's quite cheap. Um, transfer deeds, uh, that's to transfer the property on you, again, would be around the same price. Uh, a mortgage broker could be around uh, one and a half thousand up to three and a half. Um, I haven't seen um, any mortgage advisors being more expensive than that, uh, and it's also a range, so just double check with them. Uh, your typical real estate agent will um, uh, charge you 1% to 2% of the purchase price. Uh, uh, if you come with us, this uh, can be cal calculated differently because we only have a fixed rate. Uh, rates and we're going to talk a little bit more about that appraiser expect anything from 650 to 800 it depends on the size of the house uh, it depends on the um on the the ground of the house so whether it's leased or owned uh, and it also depends whether you want to add some renovation costs on your mortgage so um yeah it depending on what exactly you need, that would be the range. A technical inspector would be around 435, interpreter 300 to 350. Uh, a bank guarantee, this is additional. I do suggest that you have it if possible. Uh, it can add a discount on your uh, uh, interest rate, mortgage interest rate, and it is an extra guarantee. So um, would be best to have. Uh, it's an additional 250. Um, and then, um, of course, sorry, this is the mortgage guarantee is an additional 0.6% of your mortgage account. And then the bank guarantee, it's the 10% that you need to put forward. You just need to pay the bank uh, 250 for that. Anything that is related to the mortgage, except the bank guarantee, you see that it's deductible, which means that you can get some of your money already back. Um, so yeah. Just to uh, finalize with this, again, if you are eligible to pay the transfer tax, you need around 5 to 6% to cover your buying costs. And if you are uh, eligible not to pay the, uh, the transfer tax, you will need 2 to 3% around the purchase price of your home. This is to cover the buying costs. Great, moving forward. Uh, three tips to win in the current market. First of all, value is the most important thing. Let me give you an example here and talk uh, a little bit more about it. So we have this property at 395 uh, on Funda currently. Um, so let's just analyze this a little bit, right? So we have the asking price at 395. Please do keep in mind that the asking price has no limitation. So there, there are no rules or regulations of where to place the asking price. So the asking price is just a number that uh, you cannot take for granted as the value or anything like that. Uh, let me go forward. I'll explain a little bit more about this. So the asking price is three ninety five. However, the real market value is at four fifteen, and let's say a potential purchase price would be at four thirty five. Then, if you you do a forty k above the asking price. Uh, to, which is the difference between the purchase price and the asking price, that's a 10%. In actuality, though, it's only not even 5% above um, uh, the market value. Now, let's say that the asking price was placed at 375. 
then the market uh, value remains at 415 because we're talking about the same property. And then the potential price, again, doesn't change. It is the same property for 35. Now, you see that the difference between the asking price and the purchase price is significantly higher. So there's 60K, not 40, and it's 60% already. However, in reality, the, the difference between the market value and the purchase price um, is again the same, 4.8%. So the asking price should not be used as an indication of how to value the property. What's the most important thing is to understand the real value of the property. And then based on uh, market data uh, and competition data around your neighborhood, then you uh, make a price uh, maybe above a market value, maybe at market value, depending on your competition as well, you probably will need to overbid a little bit. Uh, but to be honest, sometimes it is worth the premium. So do keep in mind the asking price is not the value. And it's always important to know what the value is. There's a general rule going out saying that uh, you should always do it 10 or 20% above the asking price. But imagine if that asking price was already placed at 415. So then you already do a 20% above um, uh, market value, which, okay, in some areas that's okay, but uh, definitely not everywhere. And it also depends on the property. So I hope this is clear. If you have any more questions about it, just pop them in the Q&A and I'll uh, make sure I go back to them. Great, what makes a winning offer? Uh, offer a good price. Of course, uh, a good price always makes sense, but that is not always the highest price. Uh, what do we mean by that is, uh, of course, offer security to the seller, right? So um, it, it's the price with in combination with your clauses, for example, what kind of conditions you're adding in your uh, offer. If you're adding a finance clause, uh, yes, of course, uh, that's fine for the buyer, but that doesn't offer security to the seller. I am not urging you to make offers without a financing clause. I am urging you to consult your mortgage advisor to see if that's possible. And if it is, uh, and, and you're comfortable with removing it, for example, then it means that your offers are going to be probably uh, easier accepted. Um, offer the least amount of hassle. So, for example, if uh, the owner is selling because they need to move out from the country in two months uh, and they need to leave everything behind, then it could be maybe a good idea that you, you can also offer to buy some things off them. So it means that you give them less struggle in moving out or uh, don't offer them to move out uh, six months later, for example, if they're in a hurry. So be flexible uh, a little bit with the needs of the seller. Uh, also offer a personal touch, that never hurts. Uh, some people really do want to know um, who is uh, uh, could be the potential next uh, owner of their home. Great, due diligence. So now we're going to talk about experts, the technical inspector and the evaluator. So I'm just going to put a poll up. Uh, no, I'm not going to put a poll up. I'm just going to talk uh, about it in the chat. So when do you think you should book them before or after? I hope you didn't see the slide that I moved forward by accident, but I'm looking forward to um, see some of your um, answers. I see before, before, before. Okay, what everyone else thinks, do you think you should book these experts before or after? Let me see some answers coming in the chat. I see an after, okay after so we have 50 50 before and after okay great so to give you the answer the sweet spot is right after an offer gets accepted why because of course these experts you need to pay right so they need to generate a report for you they need to do some work with you and they will need to be paid it doesn't make sense to uh, book them before your offer gets accepted because you need to pay them regardless whether your offer get accept, got accepted or not. It's also a little bit more difficult. You can always uh, put the, the question forward to uh, the selling agent if you want to bring uh, an expert from before, uh, but most probably they would also say that they, they would like uh, to wait for the uh, person whose offer got accepted. So once the offer gets accepted, it's the first thing we need to do 
we have uh, one or two weeks uh, from the time that the offer gets accepted until signing the purchase contract. And it would be ideal that the agents, the experts are booked in the beginning. So we have the reports by the time that we sign the purchase contract. Um, to move forward a little bit more about the timeline. So just so you have a clear picture of it. Uh, of course, the first thing to do is start searching. Uh, then, of course, you make an offer when you find uh, a property that uh, you're interested in. Once your offer is accepted, then directly uh, the experts are booked. So the technical inspector and the appraiser are booked. Short after within this, those two weeks, uh, there's the signing of the purchase contract. Right the moment that the contract is signed, your mortgage application starts uh, and soon after the cooling off period ends as well. From the time that the mortgage application starts, it takes two to four weeks to get it accepted. Usually it's between two to three weeks, four weeks. It's sometimes used for a little bit more complicated cases. Uh, and once your mortgage is approved, then of course you uh, have a statement of completion. This is the final note from the notary saying, um, hey, this is what you've paid so far. This is what you need to pay. These are your taxes. These are your costs. So you have a, a good financial overview. Uh, and then, of course, the last thing would be that um, uh, you have the transfer date. This is the legal day where you become the owner. It's the date that you um, and the owner uh, have agreed uh, to make the legal transfer. And what happens on that day is that of course, you inspect the property to make sure that everything is as agreed and as planned. Maybe you have planned uh, to do some changes in the house uh, uh, together, owners uh, and buyer, or maybe they accidentally broke a mirror while they were moving their stuff. So just a small check to make, uh, make sure that everything is working. And then the next thing to do would be to go over the notary uh, to sign the mortgage deed and the transfer deed, get your keys handed over. And uh, yeah, congratulations. That's actually the moment you become uh, the legal owner of your new home. Um, we help you from the beginning to the end. Uh, we do stay with you a little bit after as well, just in case, yeah, maybe you need some support or have any more questions. So you can always turn to us as well. Uh, of course, we do have uh, different packages uh, um, for people, for people's needs out there. We have the smart package, which is a little bit more for people who like to do things on their own or have a little bit more experience uh, in buying a house. Uh, we have the complete package, uh, which is for people who feel like they need a little bit more support. Maybe they're not uh, as familiar um, uh, in the Netherlands uh, as someone else and they need someone to be there with them. Uh, and of course, we do have the new build package. It's something we're introducing this year. Uh, we have a lot of clients who are interested in buying new build property. Um, so we do support with that as well. However, that is uh, a different uh, process, of course, uh, and the waiting time is uh, way longer. The nice thing about our packages is that we only ask for a 10% uh, down payment, uh, and then we have a no cure, no pay system, which means that uh, if you don't have a house, we don't get paid. So we make sure that you do. Uh, if you have any questions about packages or uh, you need to know a little bit more about our services, you can always just book a free intake with us and yeah, we'll have a, a chat together soon. I do hope I see uh, everyone quite soon. So uh, I believe Rick is back. I'm not very sure. If Rick is here, then uh, we can move forward to the Q&A. We can answer some questions that uh, we haven't answered yet. I'm not sure if Rick is here, so I'll just give him a minute. And if it's not possible for him to um, um, join us on the camera, then uh, that's fine. I'll just go ahead and read your um, questions from the chat. Let me just check. Yeah, the slides will be available. We'll make sure we send them to you. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, you receive some uh, links and emails from us. So uh, yeah, you will be able to see the slides, able to go back to the recording. Um, so um, if there's anything you need there, let us know. Hi, Rick. Hi, guys. Hi, thanks for joining Hi, us. Yes. So what um, do we have? What do we have? Um, I think a good question uh, about the NHG. 
-hmm. Can you explain a little bit more about that, what it is, and what was the NAG in the buying cost? What yeah, so the NHG is just an extra mortgage uh, guarantee that the bank can provide you. Uh, this is not for every property; it's for properties who are valued uh, three fifty five and less. And what that means is that you have the extra guarantee from the bank uh, for some specific situations. Um, um, you can double check that with the mortgage advisor. But of course, it does mean that you have a little bit more of a discount on your um, mortgage interest rate. All right, perfect. Um, then should I prepare a mortgage advisor before I start visiting? Yeah, uh, I mean, you can start visiting if you just want to experience a little bit more about what to expect from a Dutch house, let's say, but I would not recommend to start making any offers or making any serious decisions before you talk to a mortgage advisor Guys, it is the most important part to have a financial clear overview. The moment that an offer gets accepted, everything moves very quick. So it's important for you not to also stress about your finance. So definitely get uh, mortgage advisors. If any one of you uh, needs a mortgage advisor recommendation, uh, please just pop your emails in the chat or just send them to Rick uh, or just send us an email and we'll definitely put you in touch with some mortgage advisors that um, specifically work with internationals. Thank you. Then a good question of Igor. What would be the best source of information on areas within a city and then specifically on The Hague? You can use general websites. I'm, I'm guessing that the question is a little bit more specific to the housing market and uh, let's say previous uh, sales in the neighborhood. Uh, for that, you can use, uh, I'm just gonna put it in the chat uh, for everyone to see. Uh, so you can use this website and cadaster which has uh, all the information so if you some reports to be generated you they'll, they'll need some uh, payments for that but definitely worth checking out and about the characteristics of the of a neighborhood so to say so yeah for that uh, for residency in neighborhoods uh, every uh, city has its own uh, website so the best thing you can do for that is just Go on the website of uh, the city hall of that city, explore, explore that a little bit more. And on those websites, you'll be able to see statistics, uh, a little bit more about the neighborhood values of the houses around there. Uh, so you get a pretty good sense of um, uh, the neighborhoods and what to expect from each neighborhood. Thank you. And then a question of Gustavo. Are you allowed to get a mortgage as soon as you move to the Netherlands? Um, yeah, it's not uh, uh, an issue, but the thing would be that you would need a, a, a job contract um, and the type of contract you have can affect uh, the limit of your mortgage. So make sure you talk to a mortgage advisor to have a more clear view on your uh, financing specifically tied to your situation. Thank you. Uh, then a question of George. Is a down payment credit 100% of the cost of the house when securing a mortgage loan? Is Sorry, it a can you repeat that? I didn't hear that very well. Yeah, I think it's about the, the, the pausing. Um, <clears throat> is a down payment credit 100% of the, uh, the cost of the house when securing a mortgage loan? And then <clears throat> is it possible to get a letter of pre-approval from a mortgage lender that says you're approved up to a certain amount of a loan? So that yeah, would be the bank guarantee. You can get a pre-approval letter. However, your final approval will come after the, the purchase contract you sign has been submitted, but you can definitely get a, a pre-approval uh, letter, talk to a mortgage advisor to support you with that. And regarding the 10%, as I understand, uh, so yes, there is a 10% down payment that needs to be done. Um, once you have, uh, of course, signed the contract, that 10% is the bank guarantee. It can be covered by the bank. Uh, if you don't have your own savings, you can ask the bank to do that. Otherwise, you can do the 10% from your own savings. However, the, the bank will cover 100% of the value of the house, right? So if you buy the house again at, let's say, uh, 315, but the value of the house is at 300, 
the bank will give you only 300, even if your mortgage limit is higher, right? So they will give you the 300K as a loan and they will be willing to pay the 10% upfront uh, for the 10% deposit. I think I understood the question. If not, please just let us know and uh, we'll go over it again. Thank you. Then we have a question about our deposit. Uh, yes, you can start. We can start the process if you pay the 10% deposit. Yeah, correct. Um, then about the mortgage, I guess many parameters are taken into account. So the question is, can you get a mortgage with a temporary working contract or around one year employment status? Yeah, you can get that. You will need a letter from intention of intention from your current employer. Uh, that letter is not legally binding to the employer or the company by any means. Uh, and they're, they're not obligated to hire you after your temporary contract ends. Uh, so it is possible to get a, um, um, a mortgage with a temporary contract. However, there are different parameters to that. So make sure you check your specific situation with the mortgage advisor. Again, if you need any mortgage recommendations, just pop your emails uh, in the chat. You can send it directly to Rick so no one uh, uh, can actually see your emails and then we'll get back to you with some uh, mortgage advisors. Thank you. Uh, another question. Few properties have subsidence issues after the installation of underground bins. Is subsidence an issue to steer clear um, of and not consider at all? My, my sound is really breaking down for some reason. So Rick, sorry, can you please repeat that? Yeah, sure. Um, a few properties have subsidence issues after the installation of underground bins. Mm -hmm. Is subsidence an issue to stay clear of and not consider at all? Uh, that really depends to what effect the owner is affected. Um, uh, and those things are always, of course, decided by the, the city hall. So it, it would really be that it's, it, it's not always the same. Even if the problem is the same, it's not the same in every property. Uh, first things first, it, we need to see how far in the process they are. What are the possible solutions if solutions have been voted and then if we can know how much costs uh, would the owner be expected to pay for that, then that could be something that can be taken into consideration. It will not necessarily affect the value of the house. It could, but it could also not because it depends to the extent of the issue. But it could withdraw a lot of people from uh, also making an offer. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Then the question of will, do we have help for half Dutch expats? I think we uh, are happy to help anyone who's interested in our service. <laughs> so yes, we do. Um, then what about the land in the Hague? In Amsterdam, from what I've heard, it's often not possible to own the land um, the, the property is built on and renting can be like 6K a year. So I think this is about the ground lease. Mm -hmm. That's true. It's more popular in Amsterdam than in The Hague, but it's also in The Hague, uh, a lot less than in Amsterdam. Um, yeah, and it would be that sometimes you buy a house in the Netherlands, but you don't buy the ground that your house is built on. I know it sounds a little bit strange, but it's a perfect way to make uh, some tax money out there. So, uh, and of course, there are different reasons that the government uh, wants to hold the ground, uh, but that is something to take into consideration. For example, if you have a property with uh, that you need to pay ground lease, um, you cannot compare that to a property who does not have a ground lease, for example. The value can be affected from that. So um, that's definitely something to take into consideration. Thank you. Uh, Shibu mentions that uh, properties listed on Funda are sold within a few days. Do we recommend to work with a buying agent or anchor partner? Mm -hmm. I do recommend to work with a buying agent. Of course, I'm a little bit biased here because I am an, mm -hmm. an Ancop Makalar, but from my experience, I know that it's not easy to uh, understand everything very quick. Uh, and there's a lot uh, of things that you might not be aware. If you feel confident enough to do this on your own, then, then please go ahead. But I would highly recommend that you have someone who's at least done this before 
or has some experience in the field so they can guide you uh, through the whole process. Uh, and of course, they can inform you about the restrictions, the Dutch law, uh, how things work, uh, and make you a little bit more familiar uh, with what to expect. Thank you. Uh, then Mike's asked where you can find the average market value of a property. Uh, the average market value of a property, I've shared some links in um, the chat before. You can check cadaster.nl and Walter Living. However, do keep in mind that, guys, these are softwares. They're not people behind the screens, but softwares. So they uh, automatically pick um, 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 uh, uh, properties to compare that uh, are deemed to be similar based on characteristics. However, it's not always like that. Uh, those um, uh, properties need to be checked. Uh, so yeah, do keep in mind that it could be a little bit different than uh, what those reports uh, may say to you. Thank you. Then we have a question from Sarah about the uh, restri law restrictions. How do you think this will affect the buying market and which cities apply or which cities doesn't apply? Uh, uh, on top of my head, I would not remember to which cities uh, apply so far, but definitely in the biggest ones. So Amsterdam, Den Haag, Rotterdam, Groningen, Eindhoven, uh, Maastricht. So uh, the, the, let's say the more known cities, uh, this is also in some suburbs, uh, let's say 60% of the Netherlands. We hope that this will affect the, the buying market in a positive way. Don't get me wrong, the competition will stay there because there's a lot of benefits, uh, fiscal benefits and fiscal regulations that help the average buyer uh, and urge the average buyer to buy. However, it does remove some of the bigger competition um, uh, like the private investors or companies that would have a significant amount of cash could make a, a significantly quick, uh, quicker process. Uh, those people will be removed from there. So it would be a little bit less of a competition, but still there. At least you'll be competing with people who are an average buyer just like you. Thank you. Then we have a question about some clauses. Um, I see an old clause, an asbestos clause, uh, sellers put in, uh, in the Funda advertisement. Do we need to be aware about those clauses? If there is an asbestos clause, I would recommend just uh, uh, make sure you have a technical inspection, uh, especially if the property hasn't been renovated. Uh, you can also ask the selling agent about the, the asbestos to see what they say. Um, but yeah, asbestos is harmful, but uh, if it's not exposed in a dangerous uh, way, then it's not harmful to you. So it could be a lot of times that you have an asbestos clause in your uh, contract, but it's only because it, there could be asbestos in the common areas. For example, uh, it was used in the mailboxes before, uh, staircases, common parts, uh, also to prevent fire. So it could be that you have that clause, but asbestos is not in your property, is out in the common uh, areas. Um, so yeah, just have it checked by a technical inspector. They'll be able to take some samples if they think that there's asbestos somewhere. Um, and then they will um, uh, let you know their results. Yeah, be aware of it. it, it it's not something standard. So let's say it's not part of, of like a contract of a standard contract, but it is there quite often because most of the properties in the Netherlands are older. So. My recommendation would be just check with the selling agent to see if they know where the asbestos is um, and also uh, ask for um, uh, an asbestos scan if your offer gets accepted. Regarding the aging clause, uh, what we need to be careful about that um, is how it's exactly defined on the paper. Um, it's not something to worry about, but it is something to keep in mind, of course, if you're buying a, a building that is 60, 70, 80 years old, 40 years old, you cannot expect that the, the owner, the current owner can guarantee the quality of the pipes or the quality of the installations. Like that's something that they will not take responsibility for. So that's the use of that uh, clause for the seller to be protected in that way. If you have, again, a property with an older clause and there's no uh, you know, serious renovation done uh, in the recent years, then again, just have a technical inspector to come and view the property 
just to make sure that everything is functioning and working right. Thank you. Um, then again, about the uh, two percent tra transfer tax, does it also apply uh, the regulation uh, for a second house for buyers on the thirty five? No, if you it only applies if you're a first buyer, a first time buyer, not if you're a second. And a question that we have a lot is that maybe a couple, uh, one of them uh, is a first buyer, one of them is not. Uh, in that case, it would be that uh, the transfer tax will uh, be at one person, not two percent, but one percent. Thank you. Uh, then, uh, can the mortgage amount and interest vary based on uh, the mortgage provider? um yeah different banks have different products so it's always good to check uh um uh, with your bank you're already there a client so they might have something interesting to offer to you or you can check with a mortgage advisor um he's a little bit more expensive of course it does come with the quality of service and the difference is that they have access to uh, uh 10 different banks with 30 different products and of course those products are different right so you will have um, 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 different interest rates and uh, different deductions and things like that, but it's not like they're gonna be dramatically different, right? There, there's a range, it will be between 1.5 and 2%, maybe a little bit higher. Uh, that also depends uh, on other things as well. All right, thank you. Then we have another question of Igor about the ground lease. Is it ground lease expensive in The Hague or is it better not to consider a house with a lease? The thing with the ground lease is that um, we cannot know uh, what, for example, let's say you're interested to buy a house that has a ground lease restriction on. Uh, however, that ground has been bought up until 2050, for example. It means that in 2050, the government will come back to um, uh, um, uh, have a, an overview on that ground lease and the conditions, and then they're going to offer some options. They're going to say either, okay, you can pay it off. Maybe they will offer that uh, option. Uh, maybe they will say, okay, based on current data and uh, was values and everything like that, we see that the ground lease would be 800 a, a month. 500 a month that really really depends on the area um, and if a ground lease is bought uh, for quite a, a long time in the future then uh, chances are that you will need to wait for that time uh, for the ground lease to expire in order to know how much you're gonna pay sometimes you can know what you're uh, you're expecting to pay sometimes not sometimes the ground lease is just active by month uh, so it really depends um, and we have a lot of clients actually who bought a house with a ground lease, so it's not necessarily uh, a bad or a, or a good thing, uh, but it is something you need to consider to see whether you can afford or not, um, if the ground lease is active or needs to be paid at the moment that you're, you're the owner of the house. So just make sure that if there's a ground lease that you need to pay, that is something that you can afford. Thank you. And then a question of George about bringing in on funds. Uh, let's say you can get a mortgage of 300K and you have 200K in cash. Can you then purchase a house of 500K? Yeah, that's correct. You can, well, you will need to uh, save some money there for some costs, of course, and some taxes to be paid. But yeah, you can definitely use uh, an amount of ca cash uh, with you. The, different, the only difference would be that, of course, the notary will need some proof of funds, so they will need you to prove wh where that 200k is coming from, but you can definitely combine a cash and mortgage together to buy a property. Thank you. Um, then are there any variables to consider to know about the future value of the house? Um, Energy label that could say a lot about the state of the house. For example, older houses have a, a lower energy label that has to do with energy efficiently efficiency. We are moving in a more sustainable future, so energy label is something uh, definitely to consider. Um, uh, and also, of course, it does define the age of the house. Um, other variables could be. 
um, the city is your, your looking location, location, location. It's the most important thing. So uh, if you're looking to do an investment, make sure you research your location good. Um, and I could say also that, and this is a golden rule in the whole world, the, the closer you are to an, a major city or uh, a city center, then of course, the more protected your investment is. Uh, if there's something um, uh, wrong in the market, let's say. Um, if you have any more specific questions like that, then please just uh, send us an email and we'll go through them one by one. All right, thank you. Uh, then a question about the mortgage. Can you get a mortgage as a self-employed slash freelancer? Yeah, that's possible. Uh, it is a little bit more of a challenge, um, but you can definitely get a, a mortgage as a self-employed. Uh, there are different um, uh, aspects to it, uh, but you will at least need to show one to three good years in your business. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of things that the mortgage advisor needs to take into consideration. Uh, so do make sure that you talk with them if you're a freelancer to have a clear overview of your uh, lending capacity. It could also be that uh, the mortgage advisor says to you, hey, listen, you're doing really good. But I think if you are, if you stay one more year, wait one more year, yeah. uh, per, per, based on the projections yet that you provided me, and you know the projections of your income and your uh, um, profit in your company, you could uh, increase your mortgage by 50k, for example. So have a chat with them, see what's uh, more suitable for you, your situation, um, and see what you can get uh, at the current state that you are. Thank you. Then we are at the last question so far. Um, if you bring any funds from abroad, is there any tax on that money? Well, technically, if your uh, funds have been taxed, uh, then there shouldn't be a tax. But that is really, uh, it really depends on the situation. So uh, if it's just, you know, bringing your money that uh, you earned because you sold a property, then of course, that money has already been taxed. Uh, in your own country will not be taxed here uh, but again you do need to pro provide a proof of fund if you're making uh, international transfers uh, especially when you're going to use that money to buy a home all right then we have some questions left um, which is the capital gain tax from the rental income uh, if the house is later used for investment Okay, I am not very sure if I understand this question, but I would say an average capital gain uh, of what we've seen in the last two years at least could be 15 to 20%. Again, that is just an average number uh, in the Netherlands. Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly from the rental income. Uh, rental income is charged, uh, is taxed as a normal income. And that depends on your situation, whether you're a, a self-employed person, if that's your main source of income, if that's your side uh, hustle, uh, or whether you're a corporation or not. So the rental income will be charged, uh, will be taxed based on your um, tax box. And then the capital gain on uh, a property in general could be an average of 15 to 20% based on the last uh, two years, let's say. Thank you. Then getting back to the variables. Um... So does it mean that the city center luxury apartment get higher marginal than a house in the suburb in the future? And to what extent should you consider uh, energy labels in your buying decision? Great, those are great questions. Thanks thank you very much. The first one, um, okay, does it mean to buy in the city center? Well, not necessarily, but uh, throughout different market figures and indications, not only from the Netherlands, but from around the world, we see that uh, uh, properties that are in the city centers uh, do tend to be uh, uh, more expensive, let's say, than the ones around the suburb. However, there's always exceptions, right? So for example, you have the Hoi in the Netherlands, there, the, the prices of the houses there are just insane, you know, one, two, three, four, five million. So that really depends. It's, it's not always like that, but usually city center uh, properties uh, could be more expensive than the suburbs. Uh, and the second one, 
the energy label to what extent to consider that but that really depends so for example if your intention is to buy a house and renovate it then you shouldn't mind about the energy label because that's going to improve with the renovation that you're going to do um uh, it also uh, uh it it also depends on whether uh, it would be significantly different on your uh, monthly payments. For example, um, uh, can you afford to pay for an energy label F? Let's say, well, that's really bad, by the way. Um, but yeah, it really depends. Uh, take it in consideration. I always like to say, uh, if I see like an energy label, I do understand a little bit more about the insulation of the house. Maybe it could be an indication of a house as well. So. Um, if you like to buy a house that you know has the old prestige and the characteristic, then most probably the energy label there is low, so you can improve it by just uh, making some improvements in the property. Uh, and if you want something more modern, then the energy label will be, of course, uh, probably A or B. Uh, and then do keep in mind that if you have an energy label A or B, you could possibly get an extra discount on your mortgage interest rate. So. There's a lot of uh, things to consider with the energy label. Um, so yeah, uh, let's have a chat more about that if you have more specific questions. Thank you. Uh, then we have another question. What do you need to consider about the VVE? So the Owners Association. Great, very, very interesting. Rick can tell you a lot about VVEs. He's our inspector in the VVEs, but uh, at the end of the day, the most important thing would be, uh, first of all, just be aware how big it is. That's just for you to know how the communication will be going. Uh, find out whether it's professionally managed by a company or not. Chances are, if it's professionally managed by a company, then you have nothing to be uh, afraid of they schedule meetings they uh, sort out the finances for you uh, so it's a little bit more easy to understand what the situation of the vve is if it's not professionally managed again that's not a bad thing as long as everything is in order the most important thing to see is what are the savings uh, make sure that the vve is not in a debt like a out of uh, um, uh, out of the blue debt the mortgage debt is different that's a, a, a considered to be a normal debt but it could be something else. Um, yeah, just make sure it's financially healthy. Um, and if there's a maintenance plan, uh, just make sure to have a, a look into that because it could mean that they would require some money. Uh, if they don't have the money and they need to do some maintenance, then you as owners will need to add um, the money for that maintenance, right? So um, yeah, just healthy, organized and good finances. Yes, that's it so far. Great. Thank you very, very much, guys, for your questions. We would definitely uh, uh, hope that we've uh, been able to share our knowledge with you. I'm looking forward to meeting you all. Uh, thanks, Rick, for uh, doing the chat support today. Uh, and guys, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We will send out uh, the webinar so you can have a look yourself. And you can find links in there to book um, uh, meetings directly with us. If it's something urgent, if you have an offer accepted or, you know, something a little bit more ur urgent, then please feel free to contact me directly uh, at my email or phone number. In the meantime, I wish you good luck. Have a good evening and uh, we'll be in touch when I see you for an intake. Yes. Bye. Thank everyone. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.